Corals are canaries in the coal mine. They're singing out that shifts and changes are occurring with our climate, and these are probably one of the first things that we're going to witness as an ecosystem collapse. And then after that, it's going to be a knock-on effect to dominoes, and we'll see ecosystem after ecosystem falling. They're one of the most beautiful wonders of our world. Like organic cities under the sea. Coral reefs provide a vital marine habitat for a huge range of species. And it's not just wildlife they support. Many human communities rely on them for a vital source of income, food and protection from storms and rising sea levels. But this most mysterious of organisms is in big trouble. Corals across the world have been unable to evolve quickly enough to warming seas caused by climate change. And so the race is on to find creative solutions to protect and preserve these precious ecosystems. At the University of Derby, Scientists were among the first in the world to induce natural coral breeding. We're at the Aquatic Research Facility at the University of Derby and here we do undertake quite a lot of different types of research from corals to seagrass uh, but in particular we cracked coral spawning here. A very dark <laughs> warm Yeah it's very dark space. so for, for the purpose here I'm just going to add on a little bit of uh, sunrise. Oh brilliant so we can see um, what we're actually So there we at. go oh, wow. we've got a little bit of uh, light. We can see there's so much in here what's going on? So what we've done is we've actually flipped the environmental parameters so that's why it was dark even though it was light outside because corals spawn usually around midnight and we wanted to make them spawn in a more reasonable hour for us. So we've got various different species of coral here from the uh, acroporids, uh, like this one, which uh, actually make up most of the reefs around the world, to the what's called the massive corals, uh, which are these ones here. So, um, as you can see, each one of these is an individual polyp, and they formulate a colony. Corals are not plants, but actually tiny invertebrate animals. They belong to a group of animals called cnidaria, similar to jellyfish and sea anemones. Each individual coral animal is called a polyp, which come together to form colonies. Calcium carbonate secreted by the polyps forms a hard protective cup around each polyp. Over many years, this results in the huge stony structures we know as coral reefs. The individual polyps can produce asexually by budding a copy of themselves or by fragments that separate and float away to attach to another substrate. Or sexually, by releasing gametes, egg or sperm cells into the water column. These gametes come together to form larvae, which settle on the surface, starting the whole process again. Why do you have them in this really dark, warm, controlled environment? So it's really vitally important to, to mimic uh, that on the environmental reef, so on the home reef where we get these corals in the first place. Once we control those conditions, we can actually phase shift the conditions to A, make them spawn during the day, which is why it was dark when you first walked in, but then also we can make them spawn whichever month we want them to, just by simply shifting all those environmental parameters, the temperature, the solar light, and also the lunar capabilities to actually induce that spawning. And it happens on a, a relatively tight uh, schedule, so it's usually four, four or five nights after the full moon, and it's predictable and you can almost set your watch to it. At the aquatic research facility, under controlled conditions, the coral can spawn up to four times a year. In their natural habitat, it happens just once annually. It's a magical phenomenon that occurs after a full moon, taking cues not just from the lunar cycle, but also the water temperature. Entire colonies of different coral species will simultaneously release their tiny eggs and sperm into the ocean. The 
colourful display cascades into the ocean like a blizzard. The eggs and sperm come together in the water to form coral larvae, but they are fragile. Only an estimated one in a million fertilised eggs survives to become adult coral. And without optimal conditions in the wild, many coral will not reproduce. And that's what's happening all over the world. Warming seas mean conditions are no longer optimal. Half of all reefs are now dead or damaged. This year, scientists found seawater temperatures were hitting unsafe levels in some areas. We're starting to see what's called mass coral bleaching. We're actually in the fourth official mass coral bleaching episode. First one was in 1998 and we're right in the middle of the one now. And NOAA, an organisation in America, actually declared that about 70% of reefs around the world are experiencing episodes of bleaching. So that's when the cymbididium, the zooxanthellae or the chloroplasts are evicting from the host and you can see the white skeleton underneath. The corals will survive for a period of time in this stage, but unfortunately we're getting these hot pools of water uh, which are hanging around the coral reefs for longer periods of time and more intense and starting to show they decline and they get disease and then they ultimately die off. Corals live in a mutually beneficial relationship with a group of microalgae called zooxanthellae, also known as Symbiodinacea. These tiny photosynthetic algae live inside the coral's tissue, feeding the coral through the byproduct of their photosynthesis. The algae also give the coral its colour. In return, the algae find protection in their coral home. But as ocean temperatures warm, the algae becomes almost toxic to its host and so are forced out of the tissue. This leaves the animal translucent and the white calcium carbonate skeleton visible, a process called bleaching. Why does that matter if corals bleach? So corals actually only uh, live in around 0.1% of the, the ocean floor. So a relatively small amount of our earth has the right conditions for corals. Sadly, 90% of reefs are thought to be actually going to become functionally extinct by 2030. And reefs, importantly, harbour upwards of 30% of all marine life. So if we lose corals, the building block of those reefs, the landscape, the city engineers, then we risk losing those other 30% of marine species, which will significantly affect pretty much everybody on Earth. Despite occupying a tiny part of the ocean, coral is integral to its health. As well as their restoration efforts, the team here are also experimenting with ways to make the coral more resilient. What we try and do is we want to also harden these corals a little bit as well. So you can actually uh, thermoacclimate them by putting them through a, a stress event in advance. So simulating that what they're going to experience in the field in years to come. And then you can breed from those adult corals, those which show that thermotolerance or disease resistance, and start to produce what some people call super corals. So those, those corals which are going to hopefully uh, just fight off, uh, give us a little bit of time to really impact our own carbon footprint. So what you're talking about doing here is creating hardy, I mean, resilient coral. And how likely is that to turn around these mass bleaching events we're seeing around the world? So if we don't fight climate change, then uh, sadly all of this is for naught. Um, it, what, what I see this as doing is, is like being a sticky plaster. So it's, it's giving them that extra bit of time. It's assisting their evolution um, and allowing them to, to just uh, take a few steps forward. That means that when we're releasing these corals out, they might be able to resist an extra degree uh, in heating. And a degree might not sound too much, but it might be what makes the difference uh, between corals actually surviving and, and corals being completely dis dis decimated within a particular region. So what you're doing here is creating super coral babies. Exactly. So I can show you exactly what those super coral babies look like uh, just behind the door. Let's go have a look. Once they've spawned, we take them into this settlement stage. So here we have, uh, here is some we created earlier, so to speak. Um, and what we have here is our baby corals. So you can see various different ages of the corals themselves, from young uh, year old recruits to those which are 
just over probably a year and a half um, and starting to become quite big now as you can see. So what are you doing here with them in this tank? What we do is we do experiments in various different aspects. So one of the key experiments was actually to increase the settlement and survivorship of corals by using little prickly friends. So these are some uh, of the, let's call them teenage urchins, but we would actually use the babies of these to micro-graze around the little baby corals. It's called co-culturing and it means that we increase settlement and survivorship by upwards of 40%. And it's a vitally important part to actually keep the algae down. So if we take a look at one of these baby corals, you can see all this green around here. Mm -hmm. If we didn't have these guys grazing in there, that green would actually become too fleshy and outcompete and overgrow the coral. And this is what we see on reefs around the world, unfortunately. In another part of the lab, the team has had dramatic results, dosing the baby corals with a treatment of bacteria, increasing the likelihood of them settling in to grow by 1,400%. What we're looking at is a coral larvae, which is the planula state, is when they're moving around and trying to find a nice, cozy place to settle. And then, a month later, after they've settled, that's what we're gonna see. That's a coral baby. So that's quite a change in a month's time. Yeah, it is. At this time, they already took up on the Symbiodinacea, which is the beneficial algae, which they coexist with. And it's actually what gives the corals their color. So you can see they're starting to look a bit more brownish. They are not as pale anymore. Why do you look at it under the microscope? So we try and keep track of both their settlement, so when they are larvae, how much of them are sticking to the plugs that we use. Because this can be a good indicative of how the probiotic treatments are working, if they are actually helping them settle more or not. How do you tell that this is a healthy coral? Um, this is a one-year-old coral. You can see it's very like, it has all its color, like the tentacles look pretty healthy, there's no tissue loss or anything, so it's a pretty healthy coral. Okay, so a healthy, confident coral <laughs> under your yes, microscope. Exactly. That's what we like to see. Oh, what was that? He just moved his tentacles. Oh, he's not so confident anymore. <laughs> yeah, he got a bit shy there. <laughs> <laughs> I spoke too soon. Oh yeah, you can see it coming yeah, yeah, back yeah. out, can't you? But these super coral babies aren't just for research. They could one day be on a wild reef, ready to spawn. How does the um, baby coral that we can see here end up in the real world? What's the next step? Uh, we grow our, our baby corals out in these uh, nurseries and then from there you can then put them directly onto the reef. And that means you can get the corals, like the acroporids, up to spawning size within three years. So it takes that sort of three year period before they're ready to spawn themselves and add to that natural population. Doing this work can't be cheap. How are you able to fund this? So these systems actually retail for about £40,000, so that is expensive. But the way we try and get these systems to the people who need them is through philanthropic donations. Other times we get research grants and that allows us to get these systems to places like Indonesia and Kenya. But then we're also really interested in highlighting that circular economy uh, concept so that people can either grow urchins, for example, and sell them in an aquaculture route or also spawn from the more single polyped large stony corals, they're called. So these are uh, rare species uh, which are, again, very valuable in the aquarium trade and you can sell a percentage of those, so 30% to the aquarium trade, and make hundreds of thousands of pounds from one spawn, whilst the 70% goes back into the reef. So you're balancing that reef restoration with business. Despite their success and excitement around the work, Professor Sweet believes their solution is a temporary one that can only buy time for coral reefs around the world. What does a world without coral look like? Corals are as, it's sort of like canaries in the coal mine. Um, they're, they're singing out that, that shifts and changes are occurring with our climate. And these are probably one of the first things that we're going to witness as an ecosystem collapse. And then after that, it's going to be a sort of knock-on effect, a dominoes, if you will, and we'll see ecosystem after ecosystem falling. 
coastal erosion is going to increase because they actually act as a wave break as well. And what we're realistically going to see is a mass emigration of people because they just can't sustain and live within those coastal environments. But it will impact everybody in various different connotations. But we really can make a difference and I, and I do believe that, hence why we work tirelessly to do this. On its own, no one solution is sufficient to save the coral. The whole world has to change in order to prevent the oceans from warming further. But the University of Derby's work may hopefully provide one lifeline.